At nine years old, I had never heard of Harvard University or University of Cambridge or University of Oxford. My sole concern was to make sure my father returned home safe. In 1997, the civil war in Albania had unconsciously trained me to become fearless and yet terrified. It is true that for a child, there is no bigger fear than losing a parent. So I would often sneak out of the house in the middle of the night among the bullets and grenades to look for my father and to find him. This was difficult at times, being an identical twin, having you, Argita, who would anticipate all of my actions, made it so that I had to have a perfect plan. But I never gave up looking for that. But what does it mean to never give up? To me, it means you have to stay on top of your reactions. You have to have the patience and the belief that everything is going to be OK, that dad is going to come home without being shot. You mentioned the word shot because Albania during that time was going through a very difficult period. Many people were killed and wounded, and we had to stay locked inside the house for many months in order to feel protected and safe. In that tiny place, in the small city of Patos, we called home, we were locked for months. But yet, despite everything, nothing, nothing could touch the freedom of our minds. How many of you, it's true that Dreams, ideas, and plans keep you alive. They give you a reason to carry on, faith that everything will be okay. And we had to believe that our life was going to change, and our plan was to leave Albania and soon. But how? Canada, United States of America, all plans to leave Albania failed. Now imagine for two seconds, how could a 10-year-old feel when she sees her dreams being crushed in front of her eyes? Hopeless. That's how I felt. Yet, inside me, inside me there was something, there was something that was stopping me from failing. Something that was always telling me to aim high and reach for my dreams. How many of you have had to chase a dream that has never worked? Can you raise your hands, please? Quite a few. But yet, here you are. You're still breathing because you're still hoping, and you're still living because when you stare at the darkness, you choose to see the stars. And that's what we did. Until we saw that, until we saw that flashing light at the end of the tunnel, a new plan, a new dream had opened in front of us. England, that was it. We had a chance, and we had to take it. Sometimes in life, there is no next sign. There is no second chances. There is no time out. It is now or never, and our time was now. But it wasn't easy. And as you know, things don't always go to the plan. That's called life, right? And our journey to England was a perfect example of chaos, complexity, confusion, hardship. Dad had been in touch with a doctor in Albania who is known to help the immigrants go to the UK. We were assured that our journey would be safe. That meant no speedboats, no fake visas, no fear for our own life. An acting plan, an acting role. You had to be a businessman and a businesswoman and take your kids with you to go to a conference. For this, you had to pay $17,000, the money you did not have. And Dad had the difficult job of finding the $17,000 in seven days. And he managed to get them from 12 different people. And it is here where he started to change our life. And as they say, it, if it sounds too good to be true, it always is. And this is one of the examples. We could forget about flying to UK. We could forget about seeing a real plane. That dream was broken in seven days, the time it took for Dad to pay the money, $17,000.
And that's when mafia comes into place. And I remember very well the day we were told, while they were speaking and pointing at their guns, they held in their hands and pockets, that there was no such trip with an airplane, but that we had to take a ferry to go to Bari, Italy, and then take a train to go to Milan, and then Paris, and then London. Bari, that's where it happened, our first victory. Now, how many of you remember your first victory? Please raise your hand. That's quite a few. Although the chances of Italian authorities letting us pass the Italian borders were very small, we had to try. We had to believe. If you believe in victory, the victory will believe in you. But here's a big question. How could a 12-year-old convince an expert immigration officer that her parents are going to a conference with their kids at the time when Albania was highly known for immigration. Very simple. All you have to do is follow two rules. Rule number one, test the waters to find people's opinions and beliefs. And rule number two, if you can't convince them, confuse them. <laughs> and that's what we did. We really, really, really confused them. We had our dreams in our hand for the first time. We fought really hard for this dream. It was the first time we also spoke Italian. And it was a pleasant surprise because we didn't know how good we were. <laughs> sir, sir, you have to let us go. Please, sir, this conference is so much to us. Basta, bambine, vattene. Stop it, girls, please, go away. Grazie, grazie, signore, non ti dimenticherò mai. Thank you, thank you, sir, I will never forget you. Vattene, vattene, prima di cambiare idea. Leave before I change my mind. <laughs> to this day, we don't know whether our story of attending the conference convinced the immigration officers to let us pass the Italian borders, or whether they felt sorry for two 12-year-olds who were desperately fighting for a better future. But here's the thing. This was only the first part of the journey. Little did we know what was coming next was much more traumatic. France, Boulogne. La seule manière d'aller en Angleterre, c'est avec le camion. France, Boulogne. The only way to go to the UK is by trucks. Forget about the trains. It's the trucks you need to think about and how to get on the trucks. And how many times did we fail to get on those damn trucks? 22. This is our lucky number. It took us the 22nd time for us to enter the trucks. And yes, our escape plan was working. You could say so. You were finally in the trucks. But hey, you were scared for your own life. Remember, you were dealing with drug dealers, women traffickers, people who had knives and guns in their own hands. Fear, that's what we felt. F-E-A-R. But how would you define it? False evidence appear real. A time of no return, it is necessary to have a positive attitude and not let the fear define you or your actions. At this situation, success should be the only option and positivity the only choice. And we managed to arrive in UK, in Dover, in Folkestone. But here's the thing. That's when we first realized what our dream really meant. And our dream meant that you had to adapt to a new role, that you had to take bigger responsibilities, that you had to be the parent of your parents, that you had to act as an interpreter, attend many social services appointments, hospital appointments. You had to go and look for an immigration solicitor, read and understand immigration laws, and also register for a school, which was very important to us. And in addition to finding a job, a job because we had to pay the huge amount of debt that our parents were in. And we were also told they would only stay in the UK for six months. You see, after all, England was no magical dream. I never went to that Disney park that I always dreamt of. Never celebrated my birthday with my friends because I didn't have any and I didn't have anybody to talk to. 
And you see, there were moments where I hated my life. And you would have hated my life too if you were in my place. Why did I have to lie about my age and pretend to be 16 years old when I was only 13? So I could work as a waitress to help my parents pay back the debt. Why did I have to live with the fear of being returned? Where? To a home I now didn't have. Sometimes you don't realize that it is under these extraordinary circumstances that you live in that prepare you, that transform you, that make you able to face no matter what, and that there will be a light in the end of the tunnel. Fast forward six years later, all our sacrifices, all our hard work had paid off as we finally managed to get British citizenship. We supported one another. We challenged and inspired each other, and we changed our life. Yet, even having a twin sometimes has its own challenges. 18th of June, 2003. That's when I learned my fate, the fate of becoming a scientist. I never thought of that. Yes, I remember that very well when I told you, Argita, congratulations, you will be studying molecular medicine with me. You start university next week, well done. But hang on a second, how can I study molecular medicine if I never applied for it? You see, don't worry about that, because I submitted two applications, one for me and one for you. But it's our secret, nobody has to know. <laughs> and by the way, I'm still waiting for you to thank me. It's been many, many years already. And here's this chance in front of this beautiful audience to say thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. And, and that's how the love of science started. And I hope that it's a love that will remain with me forever. And this is part of our story. At secondary school, we were often called the refugee twins from the trucks. As we grew older, we learned that being a refugee is not an insult, but it's a badge of strength, of power, of victory. It's through the life of being a refugee that we learn how to be resilient, that we learn how to be empathetic, and how to make time and help others. It's through the life of refugee that we learn how to create opportunities for ourselves. The first opportunity that I created was when I applied to carry out my postdoctorate studies at University of Harvard at 25 years old. Likewise, I've created many opportunities and have been blessed with many opportunities to have also worked with world-class leaders and Nobel Prize laureate. Inspired by the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, I also joined the Harvard Professional Government, where I led many key events, such as Harvard Leadership Conference or Harvard Lectures at Last. What Harvard taught me was not just science, but also collaboration, confidence, and most importantly, that success is not a measure at individual level, but it is how much you're doing for others and how much you're giving back to the society. We rise by lifting others. So it's now our turn to help the society, and that is why we're helping many students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, from ethnic minorities, refugees, to enroll in STEM so they can have a bright future. Today, we are moms. We have two boys each. We will teach our children that it does not matter what they do or where they go. The important thing is to love and give to the society. And most importantly, always remember, no matter where you're from, we all speak the same language, the language of DNA. Okay. <laughs>